that just suddenly one day took over my life. During that period, I actually had depression because of it. And it was from that moment onwards that I knew two things had to change in the world. And that was mental health can't be treated as one size fits all, but also organizations need to remove all these barriers to care as well. And that's where I got my deep passion because I saw the power of coaching when I was at the lowest point in my life. So we're servicing about 50,000 employees across about 50 countries at the moment. And then more recently raised four and a half million. My vision to help a million corporates in my lifetime. And we're live. Today we have with us Joel Goodrow, who's the founder of MindUp. They're a mental health platform that offers both clinical and non-clinical ways to support people's well-being. If you're joining us for the first time, we're The Bay HQ and I'm Amma, your host. We're all about inspiring the next generation of British Asian entrepreneurs. If you enjoy this episode, make sure you leave us a five-star review on Spotify and Apple and subscribe to us on YouTube. So let's dive in straight away to your story and like where you came from. So when you're growing up, like what did you want to be? What were your hopes and ambitions? So probably went through several things, actually. But first, I actually wanted to be a doctor or dentist. And then I picked sort of dentistry to pursue. I didn't quite get the grades at AS level, so... I then tried to sort of pivot my career to what I could do and I kind of picked like investment banking but it wasn't really the be and end all of what I really wanted to do and at the time I was playing a lot of golf and I thought you know I really enjoy it I really you know love getting out on the golf course as a kid I was out there till 10 o'clock at night in the summer and stuff and then yeah I thought you know what I'm going to defer my uni degree and go to golf school. So I went to golf school for a year, trained eight hours a day from the winter to the summer. I lived there as well for three days a week. Yeah, it was a brilliant experience actually. And I dropped my handicap quite a lot, but I didn't quite make it. So then I then went to do banking and finance management at Loughborough University and basically started out that way. So it's interesting there because like even at the early stage, you had two quite big setbacks, right? You had your dreams. I want to be a dentist. That didn't quite work out. Then you worked really hard for a year to become a golfer and that didn't work out too. How did you bounce back from those and decide like what your future path was going to be? Was it quite tough for you or did you feel like you rolled with it quite well? Yeah, well, the thing is, I wasn't really sure what I exactly wanted to do. It was quite difficult to to figure it out. And I think deep down, even though sort of I was pursuing dentistry early on, you know, you're always questioning it as a young person as well. Is, Is that really what you want to do in your career and stuff and or are you being influenced by people like your parents or your friends or other family so but yeah definitely the setback say like golf you know that was my life I've been playing golf since I was under 10 years old and you know almost every day from that period of time so yeah it was difficult especially the golf because um as a young kid you're and I didn't really know much about depression or stress or anxiety as well and I think I had a lot of those but I didn't quite identify that I had them but yeah, it does take, I think you need a lot of time off after that to figure out what you wanted to do. And then it wasn't really until probably five to 10 years later that I've truly found what I wanted to do after that. So once you actually went to university then and you started studying banking, as you said, how did you find that experience? Were you thinking, okay, I want to become a banker and go into this career? Or did you doubt that too? Like when did you start deciding maybe you can start your own business? Yeah, so that's definitely what I wanted to do back then after you know, um, not being able to become a golfer. And yeah, I did a placement year at university as well. And a lot of my friends were in investment banks. I was in private equity for some of it and also in investment banking recruitment. So I got good kind of industry-wide knowledge. But really, I think it showed me that, you know, the corporate sphere isn't really what I want to do. And I did actually start my first business, tried to start it when I was in second year of university. And I did it with someone called Mitchell. And he was a tech person. And I was on the sales and marketing front of it. And it was an online shift management software. We almost got our first paying customer, but then we didn't quite get them. And we were doing a lot of door knocking on. um, So it was because it was online shift management software. We're trying to get sort of enterprises signed up. So we would walk into premier in and i remember we went to stratford once and we we're trying to walk into shops and hotels and things trying to get people signed up but it was a great experience but we didn't quite make it with that one then i did my placement year after that realized you know didn't really know then really what i wanted to do but i thought you know banking is probably the thing i should try and keep going with and then um i did a fruit tea company as well mm-hmm. after that because my parents actually owned a tea company and we were packing and wrapping as kids and stuff. And I learned about I learned about business from them and learned a lot about the tea industry, actually. And I noticed a gap in the market for creating your own healthy tea, one box minimum. 
So then I created that. We outsourced it to a factory and we had some paying customers with that one. So it did a bit better than before. And then we also were on O2's accelerator program where they fund your business and things and they give you mentorship. So that was really good. But even with that business, the second one I tried, I didn't have a passion for the product. And it was actually one of my friends from Ilford County High School, Sachin, that said to me, do you not need to sort of drink the product every day and like be using it? And I said, I, 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 said, I don't know, really. I, do, I don't. And I don't know if that matters. And then now I realize actually it does because that passion is the thing that drives you through the lows, I think, yeah. more than anything. And it gets you through those periods of dips. So, yeah, it was very interesting. It, it, it took me a long time, really, to figure out what I really want to do. And I think it took me until I was about, I'm 29 now, until 25, 26, actually, to realize exactly what I want to do in life. What, what I'm getting from your story as well, even, for example, the door knocking, there's so many successful entrepreneurs across the world who've had that sales experience because what you're learning is to deal with rejection. Yeah. And I think that's really hard for a lot of people who come from corporate backgrounds and things like that, where... You don't really have a culture where you're able to fail. Whereas if you're in sales and most of the time you are failing, right? Most of the time people will say no to you hmm. and it's really hard to deal with. And even with what we're doing, everybody's doing, you're going to get more no's than yeses, but people only remember the yeses. Looking at that as well with the fruit tea company that you said, how did it feel to get those first paying customers? Because that's your first experience of like, after having not got it for the previous company, the software company, to now be like, yeah, people actually like what I'm doing. How did that how was that buzz? Yeah, it was really good, actually. We had a lot of support from our friends as well and things that really liked the product and stuff. And yeah, it felt fantastic. And it felt like we actually had a company and it felt like we'd actually taken learnings from previous the previous company and actually used it. And yeah, I thought it was going to be like a really good success and things. And e even though, you know, we had a lot of advice on the way as well. And I think the key one was not making that many like assumptions and mm -hmm. trying to test your product and validate it. And I didn't know quite what that meant, but we still made assumptions anyway. And I think that was the next learning point but yeah I, I think you know it's, it's a case of the hundred no's for the one or two yeses is the reality and especially the reality of sales and especially the reality of starting a business from nothing when people don't know your brand who you are what you stand for so I think you know you see on LinkedIn or social media you've won this client won this and that and I think it's um, if you look then behind the scenes and dig a little deeper you'll see the thousand calls to actually have got that or you know the thousand and rejections to have got that so i think there's never like an overnight success it's always a several years success isn't it and you said like you're 25 or 26 when you found your real passion of what you're doing now yeah can you tell us the story behind that like what happened there yeah so after the fruit tea company didn't work out so i actually deferred my graduate job to do the tea company full time actually so i did that again so i did one before uni one after uni and i then joined a large accountancy company and did internal audit there you know i didn't really know if that was going to be my calling in life but i went with it for about 18 months and during that time i actually had a physical illness that just suddenly one day took over my life i was going in and out of hospital when i had breathing problems and chest pain and and they thought it was heart problems and they were doing echo scans and lots of different things. And they eventually found out it was a, un, like a gut condition. So they treated that. And dur during the eight month period of them trying to find out what it was, I was bed bound for a lot of time. And I basically, I, um, I couldn't live a normal life, really. It was hard seeing my friends, hard even going to sleep at night some nights because I was worried about waking up and not being able to breathe and things. And after that, I then, well, during that period, I actually had depression because of it. But it wasn't depression that lasted a day or two. It was depression that lasted months and I'd never had that before and when I reached kind of the lowest points in my life I reached out to my company for mental health support but they didn't really know where to signpost me so I got put forward to HR HR were then saying occupational health counseling could help me and I tried to start that process but there were very long wait times for it so I ended up paying for counseling but that didn't work for me and it was actually a life coach, a mindfulness practitioner called Jermaine that saved and changed my life and it was from that moment onwards that I knew two things had to change in the world and that was mental health can't be treated as one size fits all but also organizations need to remove all these barriers to care as well and that's where I got my deep passion because I saw the power of coaching when I was at the lowest point in my life when I really you know didn't want to live anymore and that's what really drove me because I knew then if I could help millions of people around the world the same way I felt where I was stuck hopeless and alone in a large corporate company. I thought there must be other people like that as well that want to help. So because I'd been through it and seen the power of it 
And because it was COVID as well, I only ever met my life coach once during that period and he saved my life virtually. So I knew it could be done virtually as well. So then I knew I could open up, you know, an industry where it's completely virtual and I could help people all around the world as well. So that's where it stem came from. It's like really like inspiring and really like happy, obviously, to see that you got through that and you're now able to help so many people from that experience. How did you go about then taking that idea and like doing the initial conception, like starting the business off? Yes, good question. So um, I actually joined a startup entrepreneur development program. And what they do is they place you in a startup. So you get firsthand experience of everything. Mm -hmm. And then you also go to workshops every two weeks with a cohort of 40 other entrepreneurs. And I did it because my sister went on it previously. And she said it was absolutely brilliant. So at first, you know, you're a bit skeptical. Do I go on it? Do I not? Yeah. And I was working at that big global corporate as well so I was worried you know do I leave a stable job and really go for it but I, I knew that you know something I was really passionate about and it's something that saved my life and I really wanted to go for it and, and mental health became something that was part of my entire life now so I thought yeah I'm gonna go for it so I remember my parents were on holiday I left my job and I, I got accepted on this startup accelerator program I then told them when they came back and at first they went mad, you know, what are you doing? How are you going to pay your mortgage and everything? But then, you know, they came around to the idea of it because they knew the quality of the program and my sister had been on it as well. So joined that and it was absolutely brilliant. I, ha I, I was placed in an AI machine learning startup as the first employee and we grew to over 10 employees when I was there for nine months and incredible experience of sales, marketing, ops. I was getting mentorship from the CEO directly and the cohort of people were brilliant. And you also got matched with a mentor because the uh, program was funded by Blackstone, London Stock Exchange and Rothschild. I got yeah. matched with a managing director at Blackstone. Right. So he was bored at lots of different scale up companies and established companies as well. So we clicked really well. And the insight I got from him was absolutely brilliant in terms of fundraising and everything and how to really start a business. So it's in a great eco ecosphere. Mm -hmm. But the main thing I learned, actually, they taught you how to bootstrap a company with £100. And they're all about the lean startup methodology. So that you got, went on a boot camp for the first couple of weeks and they were literally training you how to go out, get signups, get paying customers with a hundred pounds. And our first session, right, was brilliant where you had to make your product out of plasticine and wireframes, mm -hmm. right? And they were like, make your first prototype, your first working version. So mm -hmm. it was great, you know? So I thought, right, how do, how do I do this? And I thought, I've got two parties. I've got practitioners on one side, companies and employees on the other. So how do I do it? I, I used to go on the directories of life coaches, counsellors, Used to, their phone numbers are on there, emails are on there, call them up, email them. And I created a slide deck on um, PowerPoint as well. And I sent them that and spoke to them about the product and started to understand, did they like it? Did they not like it? And yeah, the practitioners really liked it. So I started to build up a wait list of hundreds of different practitioners. And then I thought, great, I've validated that side. I now need to validate the other side, supply side and the other side of demand side. So that demand side, because I was working in sales, enterprise sales and the AI machine learning startup, mm. I learned everything about how to basically sell to enterprises. So I went yeah. to do that and I used to cold call, cold email, go and visit people. And eventually after I, I actually started all of that in April 2019, by the end of 2019, I then managed to get my first client called The Office Group who said yes. And it was an amazing pitch that I had. So I met the chief people officer. She heard my story and she said to me, I remember the question, she said, what, what are your other clients doing? <laughs> yeah. And at that point, I thought, <laughs> oh God, do I, what do I do? And I thought, I'm just going to stick to my values. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to say... I don't have any other clients. I'm looking for my first client to take a chance and pilot my services. And she said, wow, thank you for being so honest. I love your story. I love what you're doing. I'm going to take that. I'm going to give you that chance today. And it was amazing. So we piloted across the whole of UK and Europe. And I thought I'm going to really do this proud for myself, my story and helping others as well. And, and for her taking a chance on me as well. And yeah, it went brilliantly. And I used to call every customer after their session and email them to check in how they're doing and really give them the best support and make sure they're looked after. And yeah, we've basically scaled that same model of having a real good sort of really care care model, basically, of looking after people. Yeah. And obviously at the beginning, like you said, it was just you doing this and cold calling. And then you had to then get other people on board, right, to build out the product. Yeah. And like, how did you go about those first few hires to this team? Because obviously when it's something so important to you, right, to your story and yeah. because it's your background and what happened to you, how do you then find people that align with that 
and also give them the freedom to do what they're good at too. Yeah. No, it's interesting. So what, when you say build the product, actually, because, you know, we were learned the very lean start methodology. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to code. And lots of people were saying, oh, you need tens of thousands of pounds to start an app. And I was thinking, but there's loads of no code code tools online. Mm-hmm. So I actually built the website. I built the whole product. Even as right. you see today, that's still my version that I built in my bedroom, you know. Yeah. So I, you didn't need that much. And you can basically obtain your first client with a demo, with a deck, mm-hmm. and then use that money when they pay you to then fund the rest of the business and get it to a point. And eventually you might need some funding as well. But yeah, you're right. Those first few hires are key. We didn't actually get our first full-time hire until the end of our first year, actually. Mm -hmm. So we had freelancers and things, but we were servicing at that point about 20,000 employees with me and some freelancers and obviously all of our practitioners as well. Yeah, we kept it very lean. I think building out your senior leadership team and your management team is really key and getting those right people. And it is really bloody hard to do that. You know, I've worked with lots of people during this time, some that have worked out, some that haven't. And we've now worked with people for several years, actually have been on the journey with me, are still with us today. They've been brilliant. But it is really, I think the phrase is, you know, you have to kiss a lot of frogs and you have to try a lot of people. And I think the main thing is surround Surrounding yourself with people that have been on the journey before and taking their advice because they can save you months, if not years of trying to do that. But I think every problem is like a people problem. And (laughs) I think as you scale, the people problems get more and more and more. And having that right team around you, that senior leadership team who are really aligned and who can get through the lows, I think is the main thing and can pick themselves back up off those lows and keep inspiring the team during that time, I think is the key thing. Once you had your first client on board, right? So you said you then use that money to then fund the other things you were doing. Yeah. When you're trying to service that, how is the initial teething problems, right? Because you've had the idea and now you've got your first client. Was there any problems that came up that, and how did you get through those where maybe there was something which you had in the model yet that hadn't been tested and once it got tested, issues came up and then you had to deal with them and fix them and then obviously keep the client happy and keep moving forwards? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, the thing that I did, because I was talking to my customers after every session, I got Mm. deep feedback, you know, and what I used to do is action that feedback straight away. We had feedback forms as well, but I was, you know, calling is the richest feedback as well. So, and I was, I was, you know, checking in with practitioners as well as users, as well as the client. So Mm. as well as we had, you know, usual reporting. So yeah, any feedback I had and I'd, I'd, you know, I'd had to have a spreadsheet as well. So, and I'd color code it. And if I saw lots of people giving the same feedback, I would pivot the product, change the product, change the tech, change what we're doing slightly. So it was great actually that I had that. And I had that mindset of, because NEF also, the accelerator program I learned, taught us the, not just sort of launching it with little money is taking feedback on board and pivoting. And they showed us a really cool thing. They were like, your product at the beginning is not going to be your product right at the end, which yeah. is really interesting. And when I launched it, I actually launched it with multidisciplinary life coaches who were, you know, really world renowned, really, you know, high, high quality people that you could see, very credible. But then I noticed as we were sort of getting sessions being booked, lots of people were booking a life coach who was also a CBT therapist and they started using it for clinical solutions. So yeah. then I was like, this is really great. Let me add lots of clinical people as well who aren't just life coaches. So things like that really helped us. And because I was really quick, me and my team at sort of pivoting and adding things and doing stuff, that really impressed clients and users because they couldn't quite believe that, you know, one week they'd say they'd give us some feedback, give them a call this second week and say, oh, we've just actually implemented your feedback. And they they couldn't quite believe it, you know. So I, I used to love it because it used to then help people even more. So yep. it was brilliant because I've always had, even when I was younger, I did tutoring and things to really help people. And that's been in my nature. So it was really a fitting business, not only for my passion, but my underlying beliefs as well and, and my enjoyment levels too. I think a lot of people sometimes when they're starting out, they don't realize the value of that, how important it is that you can just change your idea and pivot. Yeah. And it, you've got to be flexible in that way, right? And like I said, where you obviously, because life coaches changed your life, you could be like, oh no, this is the theory everybody's going to life coach is going to change everybody's life yeah whereas you had the flexibility and the maturity to realize actually that's going to help some people but the therapist also going to help other people yeah so it enables you to help more people by not being so fixed in your mindset yeah definitely i think i think yeah ha- having having an open mind is key and i think but making data-driven decisions is also key because i think if you make lots of assumptions 
that's where I see a lot of people, even myself, you know, with fruit tea and, and the other one that I did, we made a hell of a lot of assumptions that they would like all these flavors. And we spent thousands of pounds on these products and we thought they will just come to us. And I think that's what I learned is that gather the feedback on board if it's valid feedback and if also lots of people are citing the feedback as well, then you know you've made an educated decision that, you know, might not be 100% correct, but is, is you know, good enough, you know, to deliver even better value for your product. And like since then as well, you've obviously scaled quite significantly in just a couple of years time. Could you give people an idea of where you are today? Yeah, so we're servicing about 50,000 employees across about 50 countries at the moment, from the US all the way through to Australia. And um, we're working with lots of different sectors and industries from the charity sector, like the Prince's Trust. We're servicing about 5,000 unemployed young people, helping them upskill and get back into the workplace, all the way through to real estate firms like Savills, all the way, even through to global law firms like Denton. So yeah, really sort of wide mix and range of clients and people. Like in terms of this journey as well, you've obviously raised quite a significant amount from like angel investors, right? Yeah. And that's something which I think is, now I think is, is people become more aware of how you don't necessarily need venture capital money, where angel investors can sometimes be better aligned to your mission yeah. and then help you achieve more of what you want to achieve, whereas VCs, traditionally, you might think, oh, they want to just make you grow as fast as possible so they can get a return. Yeah. And like, what was behind your, this is behind getting that investment and then choosing to go mainly with angel investors as opposed to, say, traditional finance? Yeah, so it's a really good question, actually. And I've learned over the years a lot about the different types of parties. And also, you know, speaking with lots of founders, you hear lots of different stories, good, bad, horror stories and things, and you start to get a good feel. And you know, I, I think the main thing for us is in our first two years, we didn't raise a significant amount of money. We raised about 500K in our first couple of years. And then more recently, we raised four and a half million. So five, five million in total. And that four and a half million round was the one that I really was considering venture capital money, private equity money. And we kept a complete open mind. We mm -hmm. spoke to lots of angels, family offices, and so, so many different types of people and, you know, our, our investors, a lot of them were managing directors at Blackstone or Deutsche Bank or other companies and very seasoned investors. And their advice was it's the best thing to do is try and keep it as a friends and family club and that they can help us do that with introductions to their network as well. So and they gave me all the benefits of that. But even though they did that, I still remained open minded and I still had the conversations with VCs and other parties. But as I went further and further on the journey, I realized that having that friend and family club atmosphere was going to be the best thing because uh, previously we were that, you know, with the 500k funding with just angels and things. And it was brilliant, really. The support was phenomenal. You can talk to them at the end of the phone whenever you like. And, you know, they weren't aggressive at all. And, and they're also, you know, very human. You know, a lot of our investors, their mental health means so much to them, especially our lead investors as well, been very vocal about that. And they come in and meet the team and it's great, really. I've really enjoyed it because they have really become really close friends and, fa and almost like, I would class some of them as almost like family members to me, you know? So some of them even say, I feel like you're like my son now, you know, yeah. the amount we talk, the amount we've been through together. And yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's a really good atmosphere, I'd say. But I, I think, you know, I think it's not for everyone. And I think venture capital money, private equity money, it depends how quickly you want to scale, what you're looking for. You know, if you really need that support on your board as well, then it's, it's really good and really good hygiene for that. And I think there's no right way. There's no one size fits all. You've got to pick what's right for you. It's interesting as well, because like I've started angel investing myself, where what I'm able to do for some people is I'm able to maybe make a bigger impact than other bigger investors, just have more time available. And because I believe in those companies, and that's something maybe some people don't realize as well, but angel investors is not necessarily the biggest check is the best check sometimes. Yeah. It can also be some of the smaller checks really care what you're doing and they give you a lot of free time, which helps you a lot too. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I, I think regardless of the check size, you know, some of our angels have put in between 20 and 10 and 30K, for instance, you mm. know, and I speak to them so much and they give me so much time, but then others that I have put in, a bit, we're quite lucky actually, so mm. some of the ones that have put in the biggest checks really do help us as well. And mm. I think it, it's a great atmosphere because a lot of them have come from their network as well. So, you know, mm. like say uh, James Locke is one of our lead investors as well as Sam Norman and they then, you know, really saw our growth and invested early and then like, you know, I want to tell our friends and then they tell their friends and yeah. had a lot of referrals like that. So it's become a really sort of 
close knit network as well where we all know each other and and yeah pretty much we don't have that many just sort of like you know sort of one person who we, we kind of don't know everyone's mm. kind of connected which feels really great and we can all then really trust each other as well looking forward as well now so you've got this big four and a half million round come in congratulations on that as well what's now the dream like where where are you looking to take mind up like what should people be listening right now what should they looking out for where's the path going to be yeah so i mean it's my vision to help a million corporates in my lifetime so i'm really set on that to help as many people around the world as possible and we're a team of 24 at the moment uh full time we're hiring another 15 roles in the next 18 months so and that's across design sales marketing lo- lots of different tech lots of different roles so it's re- really exciting time and we've just got our office space in liverpool street as well which is brilliant so if anyone's in the area drop me a line on linkedin definitely come in for a coffee and yeah i think we're really excited actually about building our tech now because you know i've we're still using the version that i built so and there's so much for us to do you know we've got at the moment a part triage process for you to find the right person specialism but we're actually building now an AI machine learning triage process. So you'll be able to go on there, answer a few kept questions, and within seconds, you'll be matched to a person and specialism. So we're going to speed up that time for you to find care. So we've got lots of exciting stuff on the horizon like that, which I'm really excited for. And I think we have now the team in place to do it. That sounds amazing. We're going to have to move on to quick fire questions now. Okay. With the time. So first one is, who are three British Asian entrepreneurs that you'd love to shout out, they think you're doing great work and people should be paying attention to. Yes, yeah, so I think the first one is uh, my cousin, actually, Jay Goodrell. He's um, MD of Block Dojo, which is an incubator for uh, fintech startups. Uh, so it's brilliant. They invest in lots of different startups, tens and tens of startups every year. And he's just out of his own free time, you know, helped me during the fundraise, connected me with so many different people. So I think he's brilliant. He goes to every event possible, you name it, he'll be there. I went to an event last night, saw his name on the guest list, didn't even know he was going. But yeah, no, he's brilliant network as well and really helpful person. And then secondly, my sister, Shana Goodrell. She's run several startups before in in the diversity and inclusion space and very big on trying to help young Asian entrepreneurs. So yeah, she's done some brilliant work in that space. Check out all the stuff she's doing. And then I'll probably say um, Sunil Jindal. I went to school with him, went to Ilford County High with him in sixth form. And he's, me and him have met several times on our journey when things were just really at idea stage. And it's been brilliant following his journey now with Magic, which is a personal training startup, which has been brilliant actually to see how they've come from an idea on paper to now in Selfridges and in the press and everything. So yeah, probably say those three. So yeah, they're all great. And one thing we didn't mention earlier as well, so obviously the audience won't know that I went to Ilford County as well. So yeah. I think we didn't cross over. It was only like a, a small amount of time we crossed over. But it's, it's funny for me, for example, when I reached out to you and we started chatting, I had no idea we went to the same school. No. And it's just no. such a small world now. I've, I'm recording with Sinal tomorrow, for example. Yeah. I've had now a few people from my school on. And it's just weird to see how people end up. And you just don't know. Like when you first started talking, you're at the beginning of the journey. And now both of you have done incredible things. And it just shows how people can grow together, which is amazing to see. Next quick fire question is... If people listening right now want to learn more about you, learn more about MindUp, where should they go to? What should they be paying attention to? Yeah, so you go to our website, mindup.com. We've got blogs and things coming out all the time on everything from topics like menopause to ADHD to so many different things, as well as live webinars and events as well that you can attend, as well as um, add me on LinkedIn as well. I'm I'm quite active on sharing stuff about definitely the neurodiverse space because I'm neurodiverse myself, um, as well as a lot on invisible illnesses and gut health. Uh, big passions of mine uh, with my journey that I've been on with both. So yeah, I think probably those two platforms. And like, is there anything that you need help with right now or that MindUp needs help with that maybe the audience could help you with? Yeah, just if there's any companies or anything that are out there that, you know, you think our product would relate to, we offer everything from coaching all the way to therapy and counselling. We're trying to obviously help a million corporates in my lifetime. So yeah, as far and wide as possible. I'm happy to be introduced directly on email or on LinkedIn or whatever. So yeah, that'd be brilliant. So thank you so much for coming on today. Have you got any final words to the audience? No, I'd probably just say that, you know, there's always going to be highs and lows within startups. And I think it's getting through those lows. That is the main thing. You're going to feel like you want to quit. You, you're you not made out for it. You know, your business, will it actually do well? Or have I just got lucky? And I think, you know, pushing through and getting through those is the key thing. I think your passion for your product or service is the key thing that's going to get you there. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. It makes a huge amount to us. And we don't think you realize how important you are. 
because if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, if you leave us a five star review, it makes a world of difference. And if you believe in what we're trying to do here, to inspire, connect and guide the next generation of British Asians, if you do those things, you can help us achieve that mission and you can help us make a bigger impact. And by doing that, it means we can get bigger guests, we can host more events, we can do more for the community. So you can play a huge part. So thank you so much for supporting us.